speaker this evening is Dr. Perpetua Akite, who joins us from Uganda. Um, Perpetua works at Makere University as a lecturer in the Department of um, Zoology, Entomology and Fishery Science. And um, her research spans from concepts of biodiversity conservation, um, ecosystem services and um, community ecology in both forest and agricultural landscapes. Um, and though she has worked with both vertebrates and invertebrates, her research passion is with the insects. Perpetua is interested in um, the role of insects in ecosystem resilience. So using knowledge of how insects respond to their environments in order to um, better understand their role in maintaining ecological balance. Um, she works primarily with lepidopterans, odonates, coleopterans and orthopterans and um, is a key member of several conservation organizations including the Ecological Society of Eastern Africa, um, Africa Freshwater Monitoring, um, Nature Uganda, the Entomological Association of Uganda, and the Tropical Biology Association, um, which Ichaso is also part of. Um, so with and through these organizations, Perpetua has done some tremendous work to assess and map um, sensitive species in Uganda. And tonight she's going to be sharing some of the remarkable diversity of butterflies and dragonflies in the country. So Dr. Okite, it's wonderful to have you with us this evening. And over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Papetra Akite, and uh, currently I'm teaching in the Department of Entomology, of Zoology, Entomology, and Fishery Sciences at Macquarie University. Uh, I'm really honored to be just giving us a very short, I hope it will be a very short talk and then we can just have a discussion uh, about uh, butterflies and dragonflies in Uganda and attempt uh, at a national red listing. Uh, as I've been introduced, I mostly work, I'm an ecologist, but I mostly work on insects and uh, maybe just to give us a, a snapshot about what I will talk about, um, I start off with just a general introduction about Uganda. Um, compared to other countries within the region, within the Eastern Africa region, Uganda is fairly a very small country. And uh, I mean, you can see it from here. If you think in terms of places like Sudan, you could find maybe six other Ugandans, <laughs> you know, within that one country. But what is so unique about Uganda is the fact that there is such a high diversity within this small area. And this diversity is found across several kinds of habitats, ranging from tropical high forest to tropical lowland forest, very dense savanna woodlands, dense uh, wetlands, papyrus wetlands, as well as some um, seasonal wetlands, and even within agroecosystems. So this kind of make Uganda a very unique place to just want to study biodiversity because you can't be short of it whatsoever. And um, although we have this great array of habitats, much of our biodiversity is restricted within the protected areas. Although over the years, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, observed changes. And um, what uh, I can say about Uganda is that we are having an ongoing biodiversity crisis as a result of, uh, you know, so many human activities. Um, in the last 25 years, Uganda has lost 25, I mean, up to 50% of its forest cover. That is quite a short time, you know. If this rate goes on, possibly we don't have forest in the next 50 years. Sadly, it could happen in my lifetime if I happen to, you know, stay that long. So it's something that is worrisome. And of course, uh, in, in terms, you know, of all the gains that have been made this ongoing loss definitely undermines everything that, you know, every effort of conservation that we are trying to drive at. And, uh, you know, you drive, uh, I'm, 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 I used to travel in Uganda when I was younger, 
And now when you travel, the landscape is so changed. Most of the areas where you would find forests have been turned out to, you know, open uh, large scale monocultures like uh, sugarcane, tea plantations, you know. It's such a sad sight. And, uh, you know, we, we, we are, you know, our government is not afraid or not even ashamed to, you know, kind of, uh, you know, on this, on this slide where there is all this clear cutting is actually one of our natural, you know, forest reserve being given away for sugarcane, you know, growing. And that is being done by the government, which is kind of very worrisome. But uh, what actually is of interest to me is that some of these habitats that are being lost so rapidly is also where most of our biodiversity have been recorded. And um, what um, myself and a few people tried to do uh, in 2014 was to gather, you know, uh, whatever information we had from museum collections and, uh, you know, just paper records and uh, whatever record we could lay our hands on, especially for butterflies and dragonflies, and try to come up with, uh, you know, a national red list as a tool to kind of lobby the government about all this ongoing change. Because uh, sometimes when we just talk as scientists without any evidence, our government don't listen. So this was an attempt. Uh, it was done for several taxa. But uh, personally, I undertook uh, trying to, do, to draw up a national red list for the butterflies and the dragonflies. And the reason for choosing these two groups is uh, simply because that is the, the, those are the, the two groups that have fairly long-term data sets. And uh, they're also very popular among uh, maybe a few locals, but also especially with tourists. So over the years, as people have been visiting some of our protected areas, we've ended up with a lot of records. So at least we have some records about that. So um, we went through the red listing process, which is a very standard process. I'm not going to divulge so much into it, uh, but uh, just briefly is that um, what we did, which is a standard practice is draw up the list of what we know occurs in Uganda. And um, we evaluate them. We evaluate them. Uh, we, we evaluated them against the IUCN um, document. And uh, for species that uh, have enough data, they have uh, been uh, evaluated and given a threat category and uh, of course in 2014 when we did this over the years up to now several uh, new data points have come through and as such none of the categories that was assigned to the species of course has remained permanent uh, so some species have been upgraded some species have been downgraded from the different uh, categories that they've been assigned. Of course, following the rules that are there to, uh, to guide. And so here I've just, uh, you know, pulled out the typical uh, red list categories. Uh, species are considered extinct if they have not been recorded, I think in the last 50 years. And then we also have species that are extinct in the wild. Those are species that are only known now to occur within their non-natural uh, home ranges. So places like, uh, you know, if it was a plant, it would be in a botanical garden, animals in the zoo, or in private, you know, uh, private uh, farms or somewhere, but not within their natural range anymore. And then, of course, we have critically endangered species. Uh, the endangered, the vulnerable, near threatened, and least concerned. I'll come back to this a little later on. So when uh, we look at the different criteria, there are basically five criteria uh, that are used. Uh, criteria A to criteria D. Of course, A focuses on uh, 
population reduction. And uh, for criteria A, it's actually very difficult to use for insects, especially, you know, where, you know, definite numbers are not easy to, uh, to define or to assess. And uh, later on, um, I'll, you know, mention because uh, for my assessment, the current assessment, much of it was restricted using criteria B, which uses the restricted geographical range. So at least when we know where these species have been recorded or the range of habitat from which it has been recorded, and then we can make certain inferences from uh, uh, if it is just within one place, then we can use the area of, of occupancy within a particular habitat. For example, if it is this one forest reserve, does it occur everywhere in the forest or it you know, occurs within a restricted, you know, riverine habitat? So, and then if it is uh, one that occurs in several other places, we also want to draw a line and see what is the extent of occurrence of this uh, particular species. And uh, the criteria C and D, um, D may actually apply to some uh, insects, yes, we've uh, used it for one of our butterflies, where they have very restricted populations. And uh, we barely actually use D as of moment because we don't have any much of, uh, of the data on the population structure for most of our species. So, we have, uh, for Uganda, when we drew up our list, we had up to about 1,400 species of butterflies, 46 of which are actually endemic to Uganda, and uh, 1,400 species, of course, is a very long list to want to work with. And uh, as you can see in this table, you realize that uh, most of them up to date have never really been fully assessed. So when we look at the, the current structure of our butterflies in Uganda, you realize that uh, on the IUCN red list, which is actually the global red list, we only have up to 230 species out of the 1,400 species which has been assessed. So we still need 1,100 species plus new ones that we may find tomorrow <laughs> to be assessed by the IUCN, which, uh, yeah, you know, with time, we hope it will happen. And um, among those that have been assessed, we have actually one vulnerable species. I'll show you the photo later on. Uh, we also have four data deficient species and uh, are up to around 225 species on the IUCN red list are considered a uh, least concern. But when, you, when we drew up the Ugandan red list, the picture actually changed quite drastically because up to 42 plus, uh, species currently are considered critically endangered in Uganda. And that is quite a big number um, for some countries which have barely 100 species of uh, butterflies. 42 species would already be almost the entire national population of insect records. So for Uganda, yeah, we are boasting about 1,400. So 42 may look like a small number, but it's actually quite a big number. Uh, we also have up to 64 species of butterflies which have been marked out as uh, endangered. And uh, up to 90 species as well, considered vulnerable. So when we look at the critical threat categories, which is uh, the first three, we actually have quite a large number of species falling in this category. And that tells us something definitely about what we are doing within our habitats as far as the butterfly, you know, uh, biodiversity and possibly every, any other biodiversity that depends on the butterflies or the butterflies depend on because of the habitat interactions. Um, 
Also, up to about 104 species are considered near threatened on our national red list. And uh, for me, this category is actually very interesting because looking at the near threatened species um, for people who like uh, things like statistics, those are the category they call um, marginal, you know, they're marginally significant. That means if the population was reducing because of loss of habitat, if nothing is done to contain that, it means this species will fall straight away into the other three threat categories. So that's quite a big number to, you know, to also be thinking about. And then we really have a big number of uh, species, 239, that are data deficient. And this is a result of, uh, you know, just these occasional visits. And uh, most of them we actually have specimen records, but they only came from this one survey. And uh, over the years, there's been none or recent documentation of you know, these same species, either in the same habitat or even in other places. And that is equally a very big number because maybe we have actually lost them, given that I've told you we've been having a lot of habitat change over the years. So the data deficient species could easily be lost in the wild. I, you know, it's something that uh, kind of keeps me interested in trying to find particular species that fall in this category. Uh, currently, only 41 species so far assessed from the Ugandan list, uh, least concern, but uh, we still have a big way to go as far as uh, red listing our butterflies are concerned, both globally as well as nationally, because, uh, you know, over 1,000 species still need to be assessed. And uh, just to show you some of the species that uh, fall in this category, uh, to the left, we have the cream banded swallowtail. And uh, I got this photo from, uh, you know, I actually have a specimen from it. It's quite very damaged. And this species is only found in uh, Gwindi, impenetrable forest uh, side of Uganda. Uh, so far, there is no record from the Rwanda side as well. And uh, on the IUCN red list, it is considered vulnerable. But for the Uganda red list, we consider it to be critically endangered. And this is despite the fact that windy impenetrable is one of our best protected forests. But of course, there has also been, you know, uh, a lot of uh, encroachment on some sections of the forest. And so if, uh, you know, the population is uh, maybe restricted to such habitats, we may have a chance of losing it. So we consider it critically endangered. Another species which is quite charismatic on our list is the, the African uh, giant swallowtail. Uh, the subspecies that occur in Uganda is actually Papilio antimacus pava. It is an Albertine rift. Uh, it's not really an Albertine rift species. It, uh, it has been uh, mistakenly considered to be Albertine rift in the recent years, but uh, looking at the museum collection, which we have at Makere, there is a specimen that was collected not far away from Kampala back in 1962. And uh, that was when there was still big forest cover in central Uganda, which has now been broken up. The canopy cover has been broken up and there are very small pockets of forest, uh, so disconnected from one another and so this species, we've not had it in central Uganda in a record for a very long time. And uh, until about four years ago, it was only recorded in two forest reserves, quite small forest reserves in Uganda. But uh, good enough, four years ago, we had a record in one of our best protected forests, which is uh, Kibale National Park. So at least that gives us hope that uh, this species will survive because this forest is well protected. Um, another species which are, you know, I just picked a few representation, maybe out of my own love. These are uh, this particular species. Uh, the last record, uh, I think, was back in 1968. That was the first time when it was recorded in Uganda, and there was never any other record. 
until 2014 when we had the Afrotropical Lepidoptera uh, workshop in Uganda. And we, in the evening, we put up a moth trap, and the first thing that came to the moth light was actually this species. And uh, the photo is, of course, you know, it was just a few seconds for anybody to take a, a natural photo before somebody had grabbed it off. And <laughs> it's actually nicely well set and displayed on the African butterfly database page. So you can see it again there. And it's, it's actually, this is the second record. The first record was from a forest that has completely been destroyed now. It doesn't exist anymore. And so the recent record is from a forest that is only four square kilometer. So you can see how desperate it is for this species really to survive. And I've tried to go back to the same forest over and over. I've not been able to record another individual of this species. So we consider critically endangered in Uganda. Also, have two other species. Um, the the Euptera elabontus is, uh, is not actually assessed by the IUCN, but it's also a species that is only known from one forest in Uganda, which is undergoing a lot of, uh, you know, degradation. And so we consider it to be critically endangered in Uganda. Uh, the species to the right is actually a Uganda endemic, but uh, it's found in a, a couple of forests in Uganda. So we are, we are happy with the population somehow, so we consider it just vulnerable. Um, this, plate, uh, this species, is not, the photo is not very clear. The wild, uh, you know, the left photo is actually the one from the wild. Um, this species also, the last record was back in 19, I think it was 1958. And uh, the latest record, which is this photo to the left, I think came in 2017. From again, this forest in Uganda, which is just four square kilometers. So it's quite a, you know, a unique forest, small, but so many, you know, unique species. Um, but uh, the, the previous record puts it from uh, a forest which is also within central Uganda. So we consider it to be endangered because uh, most of our forests in central Uganda definitely are undergoing a lot of change. And uh, we've also not been able to see another of these species <laughs> since 2017. So we keep hunting out and we are not yet finding any more individuals. So if I just give a snapshot also, of course, if I have to present all the photos of all our thousand species of butterflies, it's going to be till tomorrow. So let me just jump off to the dragonflies a bit. Um, we are not very rich in terms of dragonflies. 241 species so far recorded uh, with about four endemic species, which is not very bad. It's, uh, you know, it's quite good, I guess. And uh, when I look at uh, the IUCN versus the Uganda Red List, how many species we have there. For critically endangered, we don't have any on the IUCN Red List, but on the National Red List, we actually have 11 species. And um, I'll bring some of uh, them up later on. Um, we have two apiece of endangered species, both on the National Red List and the IUCN Red List. We have three vulnerable species on the IUCN red list and 16 species, of course, on the national red list. Majority of our species are actually uh, least concerned, both nationally and globally. And um, among some of the species, I'll start off with uh, the species, which is the papyrus wisp. This is a species that was uh, known as a Ugandan endemic until two years ago when uh, there was a record in Rwanda. And so far there's only one record and we don't know how much of it is established in, in Rwanda. And then uh, we have uh, this bare-faced jewel. It's uh, restricted to the Albertine Rift and very scanty records actually. I think there's only one record. Uh, another species uh, which I can uh, you know, share is a yellow face uh, jewel. This uh, species is actually only known from one location in Uganda. 
and uh, we consider to be uh, critically endangered. And on the IUCN list, it is released as near threatened. So, and that was because, uh, you know, previously the, the condition of the habitat from which it was recorded was not known, but now we know. And I think it will be updated on the IUCN red list as well. So we think uh, on the IUCN red list, it will soon become an endangered uh, species. Um, this uh, windy jungle watcher, this one is uh, having the same category because that is actually a Ugandan endemic. So the category takes both national as well as the, the, the global. Um, uh, the, the flame jewel is also the one to the right. This is also Uganda endemic. And uh, so the status for both IUCN and the uh, Uganda list is the same. And uh, we have another vulnerable species on the red list, and uh, but it's widely distributed in several forests in Uganda. So we consider it to be endangered. And this uh, slide here, that to the left, actually, this is a, a species that is not uh, actually been evaluated by the IUCN Red List. And uh, it's critically endangered for Uganda because we only have records from very specific localities in only one of our national parks. And this record came only about four years ago. And uh, Actually, this is the first field photo of the species, the actual field photo of the species. So it's also on a list. And then we have uh, the, the Sipeja Jungle Watcher is also restricted in, west, in one of our Western Uganda forests and is considered critically endangered. Um, Seragran buckery is a very, is a widespread species, but for Uganda it's re restricted to a very small stream in, uh, in, the, in the northern Uganda. Very small stream, but uh, quite a, a emerging stream down to the Nile. And since the area is protected, we just consider it to be vulnerable. And uh, Several, of course, of all those species which I've mentioned, they're photographs, but I can't show all of them. What is the way forward? To get all the species first recorded, and then also to have the species assessed for their threat uh, status. Right now, I think we are all aware about the role of citizen science in getting biodiversity data records. And uh, in Uganda, we are trying the insects have not picked up much pace, unfortunately, maybe because of the demands of, uh, you know, taxonomic knowledge and, uh, you know, the time that you have to spend in order to record an insect. It's not the same if you are just going to record some big animals. So, but we think having uh, several groups of uh, local people near resources, like near these forest reserves, making records or actually doing actual collecting if they are trained is going to help us at least first to get the records especially for those species that we are having very limited data and uh, hopefully some of you are possibly attending this will pick interest to come and study you know some of our insects in uganda because there is just a gray area and a lot of potential for you to you know get a lot of new things when you come and do some studies in Uganda. So I think um, I'm going to end then just have a few questions. Thank you. It's, um, good to be reminded of how complex and how nuanced um, these situations surrounding conservation management and assessments are. Um, I think that Katie said there's no silver bullet. These aren't open and shut cases and there's um, a lot to take into consideration. Um, I think both of you are working in different ways and with different species towards um, achieving that goal. So thank you to you both. Um, there's quite a few comments coming in, I see. Um, Laban was saying that there's many dragonfly records from Uganda at the National Museums of Kenya. And that data is, um, those data are available in um, 
Chief of the Global Biodiversity Informatics Foundation. Um, sorry, Steve Woodall here. I've got a question. I know that one of the problems with, with a lot of these uh, these forest species is uh, is that the ones that live in the canopy are so seldom seen. Maybe not there because they're particularly rare. It's just because they're so high up in the in the canopy. Um, but the other problem is as well not knowing what the life history is. I know some of these some of these um, these lysenids that live in these trees. We do know that the caterpillars feed on lichen and they they can be found fairly low down. I know that uh, Epitola are like they're not sure about Iridana, um, but I know that there's been a lot of efforts going on in in West Africa in um, with Shafi Shabulch and. Uh, and some of the French guys have been trying to get a handle on what Papilio antimarcus and Zalmoxis uses as a host plant because nobody knows. I mean, we, we know that they look like bird wings and a suspicion is that they're feeding on some sort of Aristolosia, uh, but nobody knows. Um, and it struck me that, you know, one of the problems we had here in South Africa is not knowing life histories. And Herman Staudy got a really good... Um, um, movement going called the Caterpillar Rearing Group, which is, and I know that's been taking up to a degree in Uganda. I know we see people posting caterpillar pictures. And I'm just wondering if this, that's not something that we could encourage in Central Africa, because one of the one of the worst things is not knowing what the plant side of the, of the equation is. And if you know that, then that's half the problem, because you know what to protect. Yeah, of course, uh, that's a problem. And uh... Well, the challenge, uh, I like the idea of rearing, which I, I've picked on actually in the last few years. And, uh, you know, the fact that I rear caterpillars make me a very weird woman in Uganda. <laughs> Not down here. Make yeah, it's going on. <laughs> a lot of ladies, as soon as they see the caterpillars, that they're, they're off, you know, they're on their feet running. And so, mm. you know, but, uh, um, it really is going to take a while. It's, it's actually the most interesting part of all this uh, mystery. Uh, you know, the love of food plant, you know, this, this life history stages uh, will, will unearth a lot of uh, some of these, uh, you know, records that we don't seem to get. Uh, yeah. But also the other thing is um, some of, you know, for Uganda, like the data deficient, of course, the majority of them are within the licensity, you know, you've just said it. They are, they are the way, they are, their ecology, they are up in the canopy, you know, and uh, what I found out, which was quite interesting, actually, with this particular Eridana, was that I was getting a lot of licensed uh, records at night when I was doing moth. And uh, so, I mean, during the day, they, they just don't seem to come down when the sunlight is there. But then at night, you put a moth light in the middle of the forest. And you get down several of these butterflies. Absolutely, absolutely. I noticed. In fact, I'm surprised Steve Collins hasn't uh, hasn't made more of that because when, uh, that time I went to uh, Thai forest with Hayden Warrengash and Steve. Um, I was busy getting ready to have a beer in the sundowner, and Steve said, "What are you doing?" I said, "I'm having a beer." What does it look like? Is you're just about to miss the best butterflying of the day, and we went up into the forest, and it was going dark. It was it was half past five in the evening, and Blimey, every single Lycenian, all these, you know, um, um, there were no Eridanas, but we saw a lot of Epitolas, um, several Hypercopolates. Um, they, they came out of the canopy and started roosting in the undergrowth. And, and, that, and I'm not surprised that you find Lycenids in moth traps. Down here in South Africa, we often find Iolus in, in moth traps. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're definitely nocturnal. They, they, they do move around at night, um, and, and it's something we don't know. We don't know that much about because well, it happens at night when nobody's watching them. You know. <laughs> well, that's another of the butter moth mystery. When you yeah. have to see butterflies are mostly active during day, and then you realize there's this big group that is actually active at night. Yeah, you know, and you know, you think, and, and even the caterpillars. You know, when I go on the big trees at yeah. night, because they're so well camouflaged on the trees during the day. And then gets dark, and then you see all the streaming of you know uh, caterpillars on the trunks, yep. which is quite interesting, actually. In fact, that's something else we found as well, particularly with satyrids, is that you don't see the caterpillars during the day because they they hide at the bottom of the grass clumps. You go out at night in my garden with a torch and look at the grass, and you'll find the bicyclist larvae munching away on the top of the grass stems. Mm -hmm. But during the day, you wouldn't know they were there. Um, so, so there's a lot to be learned from, you know, from caterpillars. And of course, 
if you get good at breeding them, very often you, you'll you find, we found this with moths as well. I found a couple of moth larvae in my garden, which turned out to be unrecorded life histories of species that Herman didn't even know existed around here. Um, you know, one of them in fact was something that's only been recorded as far south as, as Mozambique, and it turns up in my garden. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So there's a lot we need to find out. And so that's why citizen science and getting school children and, uh, and hobbyists and people who are just interested in life. Uh, it's just got so many positives to doing it in terms of, yeah. you know, uh, bringing a, a, love of, a love of nature and, uh, and life into people and getting, getting people to appreciate what's around them. And it doesn't, you don't have to go into the forest either. I mean, just in your own garden, um, in a town like where I live, there's so much to see, particularly if you stop using pesticides. <laughs> indeed, indeed. The other thing which we are trying to do now to engage most of the tour guides into, you know, insect work because uh, quite often they go to the parks even when they go out looking for lions and then they find lots of insects, especially butterflies. During rainy season, there's all these large paddles to drive in the forest and, you know, mm -hmm. everyone is curious. So the tour, you know, the, the ecotourism, big people are picking up insect and uh, what I do encourage everyone just to do is take photos and send over. Yeah. Try to take as a good photo as possible and send over. Yeah. And that even video as well, because most mm -hmm. of these modern phones and cameras can shoot video. And some, yeah. some, of, the, some of the best uh, discoveries are where people have actually videoed something happening. Because you, you often don't notice things in a still as you do in a video. Yeah. Um, you know, we just had, for instance, Lachna Klima. I, I, I got a photograph of a Lachna Klima larva being fed by tropoluxus buying ants. Oh. I, wasn't too sure. I wasn't too sure what I'd photographed because it happened so quickly. But uh, Shintana Bradley, this, this wonderful Croatian lady that lives down here in South Africa, she's videoed the whole thing. Um, and I said to you, you've got to write this up. This has got to go into a journal. It's, ne it's, never, been, it's never been officially, you know, recognized. And, and you know, the other thing about the caterpillars is that we suspect uh, they, they, when they bite the aphid or the scale insect, that, that insect stops moving which says to me that there's venom involved somewhere. Um, but again, who's gonna do the research? Who's gonna you know, uh, collect these larvae and macerate them and, and analyze them for the presence of, uh, of, of venom? You know, there's just a huge amount of, of, of uh, biology that needs to be done still. So the more people we can get you know, engaged, and, and it's a race against time because you know, it's, as, you, as, you said, as you said about Uganda, the place is losing biodiversity hand over fist, yeah. as is the whole of Africa. It's everywhere. It's not just there. It's down here as well. It's everywhere you go. That, that was a great discussion. But I think we have two more questions here. Yeah, there was one asking about how one can go about doing um, butterfly monitoring transects. As long as you keep the route constant, which is well marked out, it's actually quite easy to record. But uh, what, what I notice is quite hard is recording the entire, you know, uh, butterfly diversity within an area. So the best option for monitoring is picking a few uh, on species and actually monitoring them over time. Because if you're just going to be recording everything, it's quite a daunting task, especially if somebody's new to this. And yet there are these other charismatic species, which are actually very also easy to, to monitor. So pick a few species and uh, just do regular recording of, uh, you know, start with their presence, absence, and then of course, some aspects of how many, you know, numbers of individuals, taking key note of uh, the habitat itself, because, you know, if you, especially if you walk in a forest, it's very common that species are very localized. You could walk for four kilometers and you realize that, oh, I found this species within five meter of an area, you know, quite very, uh, you know, interesting and, once you keep keen and look out for that, then you really possibly add more species to your, you know, monitoring scheme. Um, but from David Thompson, just asking how receptive has the Ugandan government been to your new species listings? I don't think there's any government in Africa that is pro-conservation. <laughs> so it's quite often a time when, uh, you know, conservationists and uh, the government are always working against each other, so to say, but, uh, when we started this red listing process, actually we were targeting the, the current uh, ongoing oil and gas industry in Uganda. 
because it's it's, it's actually happening in one of our biggest uh, you know national parks and, uh, and then of course there's the pipeline which is going through other several other conservation areas so we wanted to have a document that the government can see and uh, you know because they always say the scientists just don't provide them with enough evidence so we showed them that this particular species is having this restricted range it only occurs in this uh, forest and you don't need to take down this forest so you may have to change your pipeline of course it can never be a, a receptive thing but uh, we've been working with uh, our wildlife authority to try to really get uh, you know as the arm of the government to own this up of course they do but uh, you know at the end of the day there is a, a prerogatory decision from the top so your forest could be just cut down the next day irrespective of what is in it or uh, yeah that kind of thing